Fellow Take Fivers, I want to welcome you to the first ever virtual session of Take Five. For those of you who don't already know me, my name is Aaron Shaheen, the George C. Connor Professor of American Literature here at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. When I last communicated with you back in March of this year, I had to bring the dour news that our remaining sessions would have to come to a premature end. I don't need to tell you what the COVID-19 pandemic has done to the entire globe. We can turn on the news at any moment and be reminded of the staggering number of people who have gotten sick and who have perished. When one considers how COVID has upended national economies and political landscapes, we are reminded that we truly are living in unprecedented times. It's very likely that you have been affected by this pandemic in one way or another. And I hope and pray that you and those you love are holding steady during this volatile time. When I canceled the last two sessions of Take 5 2020, I wasn't sure what to expect. And the more I heard about the pandemic's reach and power, the less I thought it possible to revive it for the 2020-2021 academic year. If you've been on or near UTC lately, you can see what I mean. Most current classes are offered online and the campus itself is eerily quiet. With three young sons, Quentin, age 10, and twins, Peter and Owen, age eight, my wife Amanda and I have spent an inordinate amount of time keeping them safe from the disease while also dealing with the many curveballs it has thrown at us and at their schooling. All of this while trying to hold down full-time professional jobs of our own. These personal challenges have not abated any. In fact, with colder weather steadily approaching, they are likely to become more pronounced. So how is it that Take 5 has emerged, rather Phoenix-like, from the ashes of last year's half-scuttled season? In two words, Verbi Prevost. Verbi, of course, hardly needs an introduction. She is the previous holder of the Connor Professorship, and through her good efforts and the professorship's funding, she was able to bring Take 5 out of a seven-year dormancy in 2014. When realizing that UTC would have to close its campus to in-person events, she contacted me with the idea to, to hold Take 5 virtually. Feeling more than overwhelmed with teaching my own classes and making sure my sons were adapting to their new schooling environment, I told Verbi that I'd love to see the series continue this academic year, but that I'd likely have to play a minimal role. Along with her husband, Hugh, she nonetheless was ready to take up the effort. And so what you experience in this single fall session is the closest she and her fellow panelists can come to, re to replicating the actual session held last November when she delivered a bang up presentation on William Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. This year, however, Dr. Katie Riansky, UTC Professor Emerita of English will be our featured speaker delivering an online presentation on Wallace Stegner's semi-autobiographical 1987 novel, Crossing to Safety. The remainder of the panel includes Verbi, Hugh, and another Take Five regular, our beloved Cliff Cleveland. If you do not already know Katie or have not had the good fortune to be one of her students, you may remember her from last year's Absalom Absalom panel. For 30 years, Katie taught medieval literature in UTC's English department and she held for much of that time the James Kennedy Distinguished Teaching Professorship. Students invariably reported that Dr. Riansky was both their toughest teacher and their favorite one. I can think of no better compliment than this. She is the two-time winner of the University of Tennessee National Alumni Association Teaching Award <clears throat> and the author of The Myths of Love, Classical Lovers in Medieval Literature, published in 1990 by Penn State University Press. When Katie signed on for the presentation, neither she nor Verbi nor I knew exactly what her presentation would entail. If we were to, uh, nor if we were to extend Take 5 into online sessions for the spring semester, what the theme would be for a full five book run. Crossing to Safety offers up any number of themes, but one that surely sticks out is friendship. And in a current world of lockdowns, of quarantines, of the prospect of dying alone, or of watching a loved one die alone, and of political and racial tensions that have the power to drive deep rifts between people and communities, perhaps friendship is the right theme for the hour. I hope, my friends, that circumstances will soon allow us to see each other in person, but almost certainly that won't be until the next academic year. In the meantime, Verbi, Katie, Hugh, Cliff, and I are indeed giving serious thought to holding an online five-session Take Five starting in January. 
That decision will hinge in part on how well we are able to pull this single session off. And to that point, Verbi and I would be most grateful for your feedback. You will then hear more from us about the matter in the months ahead. Finally, before Katie offers her presentation, I want to turn your attention to Tom Griscom, the White House Communications Director under President Ronald Reagan, top aide and advisor to Senator Howard Baker, and former executive editor and publisher of the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Tom will deliver a tribute to George C. Connor, whose birth centennial we observe this year. Connor was a beloved English professor at UTC, and upon his retirement in the late 1980s, many of his devoted students and friends created the Connor Professorship, which has sponsored Take Five for many years now. As Tom will explain, Connor was a loyal friend to many, so it's entirely fitting that this year's theme coincides with the 100th anniversary of his birth. As I now turn the time over to Tom, let me thank you once again for your participation in Take Five. Perhaps you are a newcomer to the season, or perhaps you are a longtime friend. Whoever you are in this regard, please feel free to pass this video presentation along to anyone you know who likes to read and to, and to discuss great literature. I wish you and those closest to you happiness and friendship. Thank you and happy reading. Thank you, Dr. Shaheen, for the introduction and the opportunity to share with the audience a few thoughts about George Connor and to be included in this beginning season of Take Five. Friendships and relationships are going to be part of the conversation. And that's more than who we know, it's also who we're able to influence with a word, an interest, and shared experiences. In 1969, the last yearbook for the University of Chattanooga, The Moccasin, was dedicated to George Connor. I was the editor. I'm gonna share two phrases. First, he was a friend to those who needed a friend, and even to some who did not realize they needed one. A perfectionist who demanded much but the rewards were even more. These words, his words of friendship, were expressed through letters, a love of teaching, and his faith. He had a relationship with my Aunt Isabel Griscom, who was the chair of the English department at the University of Chattanooga, taught him as a student, and had him as a colleague in the department. There's a series of letters that they exchanged during World War II. Many of these you will find in the University of Tennessee Chattanooga Library if you're interested in reading more. So in one letter during World War II, he wrote this to my aunt. As a matter of fact, the difficulties which I'm having, and all of them are mild, are not at all the difficulties which I expected to have. Unfortunately, hardly a day goes by that I don't wish I could have a 15-minute conversation with any of my friends. It's a feeling I cannot describe, never to be able to have any real conversation, to talk about books or poems or ideas with anybody equally able or better able to discuss them. Then, after his first year in the Army, and a letter to my aunt in October 1943 he wrote I had good friends in college none I've known the army can qualify I've had friends pleasant and casual who were and are nice people to drink coffee with in the PX or to go to town occasionally but I can't say I would have any regret never to see any of them again the opportunity for such happy conversation is non-existent Thanks for remembering that I did not shed my deepest interests along with my white shirts with button-down collars. Friends and friendship are expressed in many ways. I was a student assistant. My aunt, I know, had told him a lot about me. And it encouraged him to help mentor me to be even more. So, I, 
came to work for him and he would write out a lot of letters in longhand, hand with me to type. And I would sit at that typewriter and busily just type away with two fingers. And one day he comes out as he's handing me a letter and he sees what I'm doing. He said, Thomas, can you not type? I said, yes, sir. See the letters? He said, no, no, no. Can you not use all of your hands? And the fingers on your hands. And I said, now I've never been taught to do that. From that day forward, for the next, for an hour, for the next several weeks, I went over to a typing class led by Miss Sarah Phillips, who taught skill courses at the university. And after several months, I came back sat down and wanted to show Mr. Connor what I had learned. Proud of the accomplishment, but also proud to let him know that I appreciate the interest he had shared. The role of a teacher, George Connor loved being a teacher. And he loved this university. In 1964, there was a lecture series at the university called Last Chance Lectures, and he delivered that. It was the craft so long to learn, and, and, and it and other writings from Mr. Connor are found in this book that was put together by Charles Thornberry. And he wrote, the daily struggle to leave a student in somewhat better intellectual condition than I find him or her is what teaching's about. We can help the student to see that to develop as a human being, as a child of God, with unique gifts and abilities and interests, is the highest and noblest and most difficult of callings. The whole college experience, I mean far more than what takes place in the classrooms, should expose the student to first rate in every department of human achievement. Lessons as a student, but also lifetime lessons. There's an organization at the university called the Raven Society. And posters like this would be mimeographed and put up around the campus. And students would stop and try to figure out, is there some secret message here? Because the Ravens were always depicted in this mysterious photograph in the yearbook. And causing other students to wonder, who are these people? And what do they do? So I'm going to tell you, I'm a raven. And the lesson there is a friendship lesson. But it's also a relationship. You would go to a dinner at the town and country, a state dinner, and a senior had, had selected you as their choice as an upcoming senior for the next year. And Mr. Connor was very much involved in this, and I know he had a hand in that selection. And you would, as you were eating dinner, you'd have the speaker get up and one of the seniors <clears throat> would talk about what had happened to them. These great rewards were coming our way. These great opportunities to, to, to earn more money than you could ever imagine. And it was all about you. <clears throat> and as you looked around the room at this group of juniors like myself, you all could, you could sort of feel yourself and see everybody sort of puffing up. It was only later that we really learned the lesson because after we were sort of, you know, came up on the toes of our feet, we then went back down and actually stood on our feet again. The real lesson about humility. <clears throat> it was to recognize and talk about the gifts that we all had, but how were we using them? Were we going to apply them to the betterment of somebody else? Or are we going to step back and be self-centered and selfish? And not recognize that for what we have been given, for the opportunities in front of us, we need to be humble enough to understand how to use them. And that's where our rewards would come from. That's what the Ravens were about. That's one of the lessons that George Connor shared with a lot of people. He also had this sense of words that could be used, turned, and when you looked in his face through the glint in his eye, you knew there was another meaning to what he was saying. So I walk into his office one day as a student assistant, and I said, Mr. Connor, 
that's quite a picture with the light streaming in over your shoulders like that. Without any hesitation, he took his glasses off and he said, young man, what makes you think that light is coming from outside? In 1980, Mr. Connor delivered the commencement address at UTC. And here's what he said. I suggest to you that all of us are called to be saints and poets, called to confront the world we live in with the best intelligence and the highest courage of which we are capable, called to do the best things in the worst time. Think about those words in 1980 and do they apply today in 2020? As we're gathered this tonight virtually, and are we capable of doing the best thing in the worst of time? There was a book of poems that were put together when my aunt retired, and Mr. Connor was led the, the, the committee that assembled her words. And he wrote the foreword. And in there he cited Robert Penn Warren with a particular line that most people know. So I'm going to take the liberty of taking that line and turning it upside down a little bit. He dropped a stone into the pool of our being and the ripples spread even today. Thank you again for this opportunity to share a few thoughts and I look forward to the lecture that's getting ready to start. Have a great evening. Have there ever been such friends as Larry and Sally, Sid and Charity? So well-educated, so ambitious, so fun-loving, so warm. Even good-looking, athletic, surrounded by supportive others, by idyllic landscapes, and by opportunities for rewarding work and enjoyment. It's Edenic, and Stegner insists on that. The governing simile of the early years of this friendship is that of Eden. The perfect man and woman times two the garden that is Charity's summer compound on Battle Pond, with its dazzling natural beauty and reassuring routines. The love, never failing, never questioned, between the spouses and the two couples. And the snake. Stegner insists on that too. No Eden valid without serpent, he says. Early on, the serpent is hardly, vi hardly visible. We see him only in the examples of failed friendship, neatly opposed to the brilliantly successful one between the couples. The betrayal ending in death of Larry's parents by their false aviator friend. The rudeness of the misfit Ehrlichs. My husband can read Greek too. The snake we know is always in the garden. It is never given to us to know exactly where. He can take two forms, acts of God and human limitations. Even our golden couples must face them. Acts of God, the Depression, the Second World War, Sally's difficult childbirth, her polio, her long rehabilitation and permanent crippling, Charity's terminal cancer. Human limitations, Larry's obsessive work, Sid's lack of ambition, failures of charity with a little c, failures of charity with a capital C. Her name was not chosen at random. But the first thing that Adam and Eve do is acquaint themselves with the garden. Just so in Stegner's story, and the beauties of the garden make us forget all about the snake. It is all so charming and we don't meet him for a long time. Even the years of struggle are charming. In a way, Stegner writes, it's beautiful to be young and hard up. We have such hopes for the impoverished newlyweds, Larry and Sally Morgan, in their cramped cellar sneaking tantalizing glimpses of the academic life they hope to join in the University of Wisconsin's English department as Larry tries to make the most of a one-year appointment. Then the blazing illumination of Sid and Charity. Stegner compares her to a burning lighthouse. With their wealth, their distinguished connections, their helpfulness, their total improbable compatibility with Larry and Sally. Their insistence on finding out all about them, seeing them constantly, and it's real, it's genuine. Friendship, the real thing, which becomes deep, lifelong friendship. It won't change. Right up to the end of their story, it never does change. They're right to be dazzled, 
that kind of friendship is rare. Maybe we first meet the snake in the flashback about Sid and Charity's courtship. Sid, with his $4 million trust fund, shows up at Battle Pond looking disreputable because he doesn't care about clothes. He's quiet and diffident by nature, forgettable, Segner says. He's wearing a dirty shirt and hasn't brought another. He and Charity are already in love. At breakfast, Charity announces that they want to get married, putting her mother, who hasn't been told about the trust fund, in the uncomfortable position of having to explain to Sid's face why she considers him unsuitable as a candidate for her daughter's hand. Charity lets her twist in the wind for quite a while, lets her ask a lot of questions, before revealing, gradually, that there is no economic problem. Her mother is gracious enough to grant her approval immediately and rejoice with them, but Charity's clear enjoyment of her little deception gives the reader pause. Is it quite charitable? to cause her mother this anxiety and distress, then crow over her victory and the success of her deception? But we conclude, never mind. All's well that ends well. Besides, Sid and Charity are wonderfully faithful and generous friends who prove themselves again and again, even in the most difficult circumstances over the course of many years. The activities they plan for themselves and the Morgans are enviable. The opportunities they make available to them make their lives easier at several crucial points. And it is not too much to say that the help they give in emergencies is indispensable. One of the greatest delights of this novel is the narrative of all the wonderful things these two couples do together, all of them planned and enabled by Sid and Charity Lang. Beginning in the days of those one-year appointments in Wisconsin, the Langs throw lively parties to which the best, their best friends, the Morgans, are always invited. The professors dine on their meticulously prepared food, as different, Larry says, from their usual bland diet, as escalope de veau is from a baked potato. Enjoy their comprehensive collection of wines and liquors, recite poetry, debate the merits of literary works, listen to music, and chase Sid's intellectual hairs around the dinner table. The wealth of the Langs is not just material, it is cultural, and they're eager to share it with everyone but they also honor the Morgans above all other guests, welcoming them extravagantly and giving them the best seats at dinner, the most attention. Even though they have only their salary, as a snobbish colleague puts it, they are loved and made to feel it. The reader has to agree with Charity when she says to her guests, I don't know about you, but Sid and I think a little city like this with a good university in it <clears throat> is the real flowering of the American dream. There are many reasons why the initiative for the constant excursions and celebrations is always with the Langs. Larry and Sally Morgan are by nature quiet and retiring. They have a loving, intimate marriage and feel sufficient unto themselves. They don't have any money. Larry is a genuine workaholic, a driven natural writer who must be persuaded to leave his work table. But a good argument could be made that the stimulation of the Langs' busy social round rescues them from what might easily have become a dreary routine. The Langs are good for them. The couples are good for each other. Sid and Charity are constantly just showing up, dragging them out of their dark basement to go on picnics, to sit under the silver maples and watch the boats on the river, to contemplate obstetrical matters. Charity and Sally are expecting babies at about the same time, to trade opinions on their latest reading, and to reinforce Larry's sometimes apparently feckless determination to keep writing novels no matter what. They attend movies, plays, lectures, art classes, photography shows, teas. They discuss their families. In the case of Larry and Sally, deceased. In the case of Charity, large, active, and close. And in the case of Sid, troubling. Sid's father, now dead, was repressive, and Sid let himself be repressed. Expected to follow his father into business, Sid found that he loved literature and writing poetry, for which his father had only contempt. He managed to publish some poems, Sid says, but every time I wrote one, I could feel my father's eyes on me. Every time I published one, I'd read it with his eyes and gag. Even the trust fund that makes Sid's life so pleasant was established as a gesture of contempt 
by a father who felt sure he would never be able to support himself. Now Sid finds it hard to write, impossible to publish. Larry encourages him, but Sid won't talk about his poems. Sid's censorious father, gone before the action of the novel even begins, will become a very important character in it. But even with academic termination hanging over their heads, fun is the order of the day. The Langs spend every summer at Charity's compound on Battle Pond, and so, of course, must the Morgans. The compound, with its glorious natural beauty, its plain living and high thinking, the constant round of guests, is the real Eden of the story. For years, the two couples enjoy it together, along with Charity's big, interesting academic family and a rotating cast of other friends. The family routines, strict as they seem, Larry calls them as fixed as those of Alcatraz, do allow for balanced enjoyment of all that the place and the people have to offer. Mornings are for work with the men going off to small cabins called think houses to write. Afternoons are for play in the fields and on the lake, long walks, games, boating. And evenings are for communal dinners, children excluded, where everyone assembles to enjoy classical music singing and talk, both playful and serious, on academic and personal matters. The surroundings are austere, even shabby, with a kind of reverse snobbery characteristic of New England intellectuals. Here, the couples cement their friendship. Later in midlife, with high school and college-age children and stable jobs, they will graduate to serious fun, spending a year together in Florence, where they reproduce the Battle Pond routine morning work, afternoon touring, even evening dining in the most beautiful city in Italy. Here again, the Eden motif recurs. Larry says, we were once again four in Eden, and that is not a mere verbal flourish. We felt it, talked about it, argued its meanings. It affected our perception of the things we took in. And they take in everything, the landscape, the pensiones, the museums they visit again and again carrying Sally up the steps when they have to. It is paradise regained, and their favorite painting is Masaccio's Expulsion from Paradise, his Eve clumsy with woe, stricken with desolate realization, and Adam stumbling beside her with his hand over his eyes. It was, they thought, the opposite of their own situation, travelers in the full bliss of this new Eden. If they were, it was in large part because the Langs had afforded them crucial opportunities that led them there. Seeing that Larry and Sally have no realistic plans to support themselves and their child after he loses his teaching job, Charity arranges a dinner party to which she invites her uncle Richard, who is in the publishing industry. She arranges a seating chart that places Larry across from him at the table. She arranges for Larry to read a chapter from his latest novel to the assembled company. Uncle Richard, impressed, will go on to hire Larry and publish his books. Larry, the eternal naive, will have no idea of how all this came about until Sally explains it to him. Seeing that the Morgans have nowhere to go after he loses his job, Charity installs Larry in the Langs, Wisconsin house to finish his book while she takes Sally and the baby with her and Sid to Battle Pond. Larry rejoins them near the end of the summer for three weeks of what he describes yet again as paradise. The snake, for the time being, is in hiding, but not for long. Not only do the Langs provide for the Morgans, but they rescue them in emergencies, sometimes at considerable personal sacrifice. When Larry emerges from the hospital, exhausted, overwhelmed, and ill after Sally's difficult childbirth, Sid takes his classes and sends him home to sleep. When the couples are caught in a sudden storm during a sailing excursion, Charity's abrupt command to reverse course and go home saves their lives. After the boat capsizes and they're rescued in considerable danger from hypothermia, Charity and Sid visit them at home just after they've warmed up to make sure they've recovered. Larry says, I was thinking, and I'm sure Sally was too, what it must have taken in the way of friendly concern to get them into their clothes and out to the car and across town to us. I wondered if we would have been capable of it. In fact, we hadn't been. It hadn't occurred to us to worry about them as they had about us. When Sally is stricken with polio on the camping trip at Tickle Naked Pond, Sid rides bareback eight miles to summon help while Char charity ministers 
to the unconscious feverish Sally. When Sally needs expensive physical therapy in Warm Springs, something entirely out of reach for the Morgans, the Langs insist on paying for it. When she becomes discouraged during her physical therapy, Charity drops everything, including the grand house she's building in Wisconsin. And Charity loves nothing better than planning a house to travel to Warm Springs and stay with Sally to cheer her on. In Wisconsin, Sid takes care of all the children, including the Morgan's baby. It isn't just that the Langs offer money and the things that money can buy. They offer themselves, their time and energy and their presence whenever Sally and Larry need them. I confess that midway in this novel, I underestimated Stegner. Clearly this friendship was too good to be true. I reasoned that he was setting the reader up for a grand betrayal on the order of the betrayal of friendship that cost Larry's parents their lives. That, I figured, was foreshadowing. Somebody was about to do something terrible. How wrong I was. The fact is, the friends were about to do something even more wonderful. A great, consummately subtle act of love, in fact, a number of them, that would never even be recognized or acknowledged. Have you forgotten the serpent? In the second half of the novel, he raises his head and threatens their eyes. And Stegner asks and answers the most important question of the novel. What do you do about a difficult friend? It's a deeper question than it seems. It's really the question of how we're to treat each other, what we're to tolerate in each other, how we're to get along in relationship to each other, how we're to live together on the earth in charity. Because charity the woman, like charity the virtue, is difficult, and she gets more difficult all the time. Often, she seems to lack charity. Rigid, dictatorial, with a disposition to dominate, even humiliate others, she shoulders her way through life, blunt, as Larry puts it, as a splitting mall. If your rights leave off, as the proverb has it, where your neighbor's nose begins, then charity smashes a lot of noses. It starts out small with her perverse pleasure in keeping the secret of Sid's wealth from her mother. But it grows until in the end, a dying charity seems determined to deny Sid what he wants most, what he considers his right, to comfort her and grieve with her as she dies. The reader learns of charity's controlling ways gradually, as Larry and Sally do. Maybe she's just naturally domineering, or maybe, as Stegner suggests, she learned it from her mother, who believes that industrialization has led men to abdicate authority in the domestic sphere and it's up to women to lead. It seems a little odd, but perhaps allowable, that she habitually silences everyone, even in mid-conversation, for the customary after-dinner music. If I wanted to do this, I might do it by gathering everyone and making a preliminary announcement. Could we get together for a few quiet moments to listen to Beethoven's Ninth? It's so wonderful, we should hear every note. But Charity does it abruptly, in typical Charity fashion, by interrupting conversation with a loud shh, and she offends the few people who stay offended for a while. It seems that her need for control escalates as time goes on. When the couples are packing for the walking trip at Battle Pond, Charity insists that the camping supplies, already inventoried and packed, be unpacked so that a second inventory can be made, justifying this to a reference to one Mr. Pritchard who has apparently written the defin definitive book on camping. Sid is incredulous. There are a lot of supplies. You mean take everything out and repack it? Larry defends Sid. A confrontation develops. Charity loves a confrontation. It's a challenge, another opportunity to win. The men yield, people often yield to Charity just to avoid prolonging the argument, and begin the unpacking. The men call out the items as they unpack them while Charity checks them off. But then there's another confrontation because in the end, the packet of tea has not been checked off for the second time. The only plausible explanation for this, Charity says, is that nobody packed the tea. Tactfully, the others avoid suggesting the more likely explanation that Charity neglected to check it off. Eventually, Sally goes off to find another packet of tea and Larry stuffs it into the hamper. At the cab site, the men will find the first packet and burn it in the campfire so that Charity will never know she was wrong. Later, Sally, who has insight into Charity that the others lack, 
will say that Charity feels sorry about the silly argument over the tea. If she does feel sorry, she never says so. Charity has also insisted that the couples take canes on the trip, alpenstock trekking poles that she brought in Europe. She wants to see them walking with the poles at all times. Larry sort of likes his pole and uses it, but Sid hates his, whether because he dislikes walking with a pole or because he doesn't like being told what to do, we never find out, and surreptitiously flings it into the brush. Sid fairly often defies Charity covertly. He never defies her openly. On the same trip, when the couples get lost in the woods, they debate whether to return to the brook, where fishermen would probably have beaten a path back to the main trail, or whether to follow the compass course recommended by Charity on the authority of the Pritchard guidebook. Guess, says Larry, which we did. The compass leads them on a rugged and circuitous route, and they end up exhausted, soaking their feet in the brook. Larry cannot resist registering protest, but not wishing to offend Charity, he frames it, as he usually does, as an opaque literary illusion. He has an inexhaustible stock of them. Dulcinea del Toboso, he shouts. Dulcinea, of course, was Don Quixote's imaginary beloved, the object of his insane and futile quest. Sally shoots him a monitory glance, and he subsides. Sally has asked him to treat Charity gently on this trip. Larry does not know why. Perhaps by this point, the reader does. Charity's next Thermopylae is also the strangest, the three-minute chicken. Three minutes on each side is apparently Pritchard's prescribed time for roasting a chicken over a campfire. Nobody I know who's ever roasted a chicken could possibly believe this, but Charity does because she read it in Pritchard. So she obediently plates the chicken after three minutes, and because it's Charity, everyone obediently tries to eat it. It's running with blood, even cutting it is hard. Chewing it is impossible. Nobody wants to say so. They just put it down and eat their vegetables. But an extraordinary moment is coming, the first and only time in the course of this narrative that Charity apologizes for anything. I apologize, she says. It was going to be such a nice dinner and I spoiled it. Here, give me your chickens and I'll do them right. And further, I deserve some penance for being bullheaded and not listening to Larry. Larry wants to give her a good lecture, maybe bringing up the second packet of tea that they burned to spare her feelings, and the folly of basing your behavior on the rules laid down in some book rather than on common sense. He wants to deliver that lecture, but he doesn't. Nobody ever does. Charity will attempt to dominate even strangers. When the couples come across the Italian man who has seriously injured his hand working on the rock pile, they decide to drive him into the nearby village for medical treatment. But when the man, perhaps seeing a familiar place or person, asks them to stop and gets out of the car, Charity insists that they follow him and put him back in. We can't let him walk. He needs help whether he wants it or not. Why did you let him out? When Larry reasonably points out that he let the man out because he wanted out, and that they can't possibly put him back in by force, Charity finally subsides. But it's apparent that she would have resorted to kidnapping to take that man where she thought he should go. Then there's the battle over the dishes. When the Morgans visit the Langs at Battle Pond after Sid has failed to achieve tenure at Wisconsin, it becomes apparent that it is now Sid's role to do the dishes. Charity has a decreed it. When Larry offers help, Sid becomes panicky. Charity has forbidden him to accept help. Larry belongs in the living room listening to the music. You must leave the kitchen, Sid says, please leave. It's an unattractive display of anxiety over a trivial matter. Sid appears diminished, even craven. Larry considers the whole debate silly and helps anyway. But it isn't silly. There's a deeper logic to the way Sid and Charity's friends react to Charity's ultimatums. They love her. That is what we need to keep in mind. This is a book about love. Of course, the most striking instance of Charity's dictatorial nature occurs around the time of her death, but the most troubling one is her ongoing insistence in shaping Sid into the man she has decided he should be. 
It's troubling not just for her violation of his personal integrity, but for a kind of punitive mean-spiritedness not seen in her other attempts at bending people to her will. Charity marries a man with a doctoral degree like her father in the expectation that he will become a professor like her father, and she will continue the tradition of Battle Pond unbroken by any deviation from the pattern of her family of origin, aside from Sid's wealth, which will just make it all easier. She has it all planned out. Sid will take the one-year appointment at Wisconsin, will be continued onto the tenure track, will write scholarly books and articles on Robert Browning, which will result in tenure. They will build a grand house in Madison that will become the center of the English department's social life. They will have many children. Eventually, Sid will retire, showered with honors. From the very beginning, this is all pure fantasy. Charity ignores clear indications that the pattern is not what Sid has in mind at all. In his initial talk with Aunt Emily, he quotes Yeats's poem, The Lake Isle of Innisfree, Sid has a head full of poetry, and says that what he would really like to do is retire to the woods where there would be books, music, beauty, and peace, and just read and think and write poems. Like Yeats, he says, as his work, he would like to cultivate nine bean rows. Charity attacks. That's defeatist. It's total retreat, feeding your own selfish face, indulging your own lazy inclinations. When Charity suggests teaching, Sid seems never to have considered it. I have to take a job. Is that it? A wealthy man with no need to work, Sid clearly plans to read widely and become a poet. He has taken the doctorate not as the path to an academic vocation, but because a poet should have his head filled with ideas. Charity's response is devastating. Why should you undervalue yourself? Like Sid's father, Charity has nothing but contempt for the life he wants to lead. She considers it unlikely that he will become a great poet and with her usual absolut absolutism, considers nothing short of greatness worth achieving. Sid's father's attitude made it difficult for him to write poetry. Charity's will make it impossible. He loves Charity. He will try as hard as he can to become the man she plans for him to be. It doesn't go especially well. And even though Sid goes on to define his goals in terms of what Charity wants and manages more or less to conform himself to her plans, she develops a kind of casual chronic contempt for him, a simultaneous wish to improve and punish him that is painful to witness. Her method of encouraging him is to issue commands have some confidence in yourself. If they demand publications, write some. You can do anything you decide to do. When Larry suggests that Sid's wealth frees him, that he doesn't really need the teaching job, Sid frames his response entirely in terms of what Charity expects. You forget Charity's timetable. I promised her. She says our commitment to teaching is like a marriage vow. At the same time, he reports Charity's latest method of encouragement. She's betting that he won't be able to complete a scholarly article before she returns from the hospital with her latest child. In fact, Sid is constitutionally incapable of completing a scholarly article, and he never does. Scholarly writing is deeply uncongenial to him. He's a poet. But knowing his father's and Charity's disapproval of his vocation, he can scarcely write poetry either. In any case, as Stegner mentioned, Sid is building his career at a time when creative writers were seriously undervalued in the academy. When I was studying for my doctorate at the University of Virginia in the 1970s, that was still to some extent the case. Of the traditional three roles of a university professor, teaching, scholarship, and service, he's really successful only at one, teaching. Teaching, Sid says, is Okay, but it is often, alas, not the most significant role for career advancement, and Sid struggles to advance, finally achieving full professorship only when he's near retirement. When Sid achieves continuation at Wisconsin, Larry congratulates him, but Sid replies only that Charity is not impressed. She doesn't regard that as a success, but only as a kind of stalemate. She would respect only the award of tenure. Throughout his career, Charity polices his progress, 
She not only keeps reminding him to write scholarly articles, she prescribes the topics. Browning's use of music, Browning's debt to Vasari. Instead, he writes poetry in secret, which when she discovers it makes her furious and they quarrel. Of the Browning articles, Larry says, his heart isn't in it, only her heart is. It is equally true of his whole academic career. As Charity sees it, she's done more than her part to ensure his success. Building a big hospitable house, acting as a stellar hostess to his colleagues, providing him with a family. She doesn't understand why he can't just publish a few articles. But it's simple. Sid doesn't want to be a scholar. He's in the wrong profession. Sally understands both the Langs better than anyone else, and she knows how much both will suffer if he doesn't achieve tenure at Wisconsin. Of charity, she says, she just died. She's uncomfortably near the truth. Of Sid, can't you see how much worse it will be for him, knowing she'll be devastated if he doesn't make it in her terms? As it turns out, they both suffer, charity even more than Sid. She has an emotional breakdown and spends two months in a sanatorium because of his career setback. Not for the first time, I found myself wishing this woman had a career of her own in which to invest her boundless ambition. But when the friends reunite at Battle Pond to say their last goodbyes to Charity, we learn that she's disappointed even in Sid's relatively successful later career at Dartmouth. Granted a full professorship and a teaching award, Sid will retire with at least a respectable record. But Charity isn't impressed. The honors came too close to retirement. They are, she says, a sort of booby prize. Their daughter, Hallie, who reports on this, asks the Morgans, do you think he could have been a poet if she'd let him? But these insults pale in comparison to Charity's cold determination to impose her will on Sid at the time of her death. She wants to die the right way. Dying is an important event, she says. I want to do it right. She wishes there were a manual as there is for camping. There's no decent literature on how to die. Lacking literature, she devises her own plan. She will not accept treatment for her cancer. Everything should go on as usual. There should be a picnic for her birthday as usual and she should attend it. They should load the old Marmon car with picnic supplies as usual and drive to the usual place and leave the children in the usual songs and games. She has scheduled last visits with each of her grandchildren. She has planned out the lives of her survivors. For Sid, she plans remarriage, furnishing a list of five women she considers suitable. When she finally proves too weak to go to the picnic, she directs Sid to join the group as usual and catch up with her the following day. Sid is devastated. He wants to be with her. He wants to put his arms around her and cry. He says to Larry, I just wonder sometimes if she knows people have feelings, but he's terrified she'll give him the silent treatment if he opposes her plans. He can't endure the silent treatment. He's terrified that if she leaves, if he leaves, she may die in his absence. We never learn if he does, if she does. When she banishes him and Larry from her bedside, ordering them to go to the picnic, Sid resists her. He pleads, but she says, you must. He weeps, shouts, flatly refuses. Why am I shut out? Do you hate me? He crouches by the bed and embraces her sobbing, but she lies stiffly rejecting his embrace and insists on having her way. Finally, he yields. Witnessing Charity and Sid's relationship has prompted their children over the years to wonder why they stay together. It's been, says their daughter Hallie, a kind of agony for both of them. Her husband, Mo alludes to two characters in Catherine Ann Porter's novel, Ship of Fools, a man and woman mortally locked together, ceaselessly stabbing and hitting each other. Of Sid and Charity, he says, they aren't individuals, but a confrontation. It's a mutual crucifixion. Larry agrees, they've missed something and show it, but there are hints of what holds them together. During the camping trip at Tickle Naked Pond, we're shown their strong sexual bond. Early one morning, Larry is awakened by splashing sounds and peeping out of his tent sees Sid and Charity, splendidly naked, picking berries. He notes Sid's dominance. Charity is following him, picking where he designates, 
appearing as the docile female, and Sid's powerful physique. Larry realizes that Charity isn't always in charge in this marriage. It isn't Pritchard who calls the shots this morning, nor was it Pritchard, I'm sure, who called the shots last night. This shocked me. Stegner hits very few false notes, but this is one. I can't be the only reader who's made uncomfortable by the suggestion that one partner or the other might call the shots in a sexual encounter. But the point is made that in one area, at least, Sid retains power. And he tells Larry plainly how much his marriage means to him. During the reunion for Charity's last illness, he acknowledges that it has been a kind of bondage, but says, my marriage is a slavery I couldn't bear to part with. I value it above anything. Then he makes an odd confession that Larry's marriage, which Sid also considers a kind of slavery, has been comforting to him in his own situation. After all, Larry has been tied to the disabled Sally, obliged to wait on her and probably prevented from realizing his full potential. Although Larry is taken aback by this suggestion, Larry and Sally are so close that her disability, painful as it is to both of them, is irrelevant to their bond. He says only, I never want it out. Sid's confession incidentally reveals a troubled spirit. Taking satisfaction in the misfortune of another is one of the doctrinal definitions of the sin of envy. But Sid is a gentle, patient man. Most of Charity's friends can take only so much of her before they need a break. By my calculation, there are a total of 13 years during which the Morgans see the Langs only rarely or not at all. Sally, reminiscing near the time of Charity's death about the most recent estrangement of eight years, says that she regrets it. I let myself get irritated at her way of taking charge of everything. I thought she was a tyrant to all of you in the family. I still do. But I shouldn't have let myself forget what a wonderfully unselfish friend she has been. I should have had the grace to forgive what I knew she couldn't help. Did you ever wonder why under the lash of Charity's whip, none of her friends ever objected to her demands? Why did no one ever say, Charity, I remember packing that tea, it's in there, now let's get going. Or, I don't think people feel like listening to music right now, let's just chat for a while. Or, I'm sorry, but we need to go back to the creek. I know the trail is near it. Or, I'm just not cut out to be a professor. We don't need the salary, so I'm going to see what I can do as a poet. What is Stegner trying to tell us about love and friendship, about how we're to treat each other, how we're to live together on the earth in charity, through her friend's endless indulgence of the woman charity, this forbearance that becomes so exasperating to the reader? In this book, In Between the Lines, is the message that real friends really know each other. We're told again and again how strong Charity is. Too strong for Sid, says her father, says Hallie. But those who really understand her know better. Like all rigid and controlling people, she's weak. It's significant that she's the only one of the friends to experience an emotional breakdown, the first of the friends to die. Sally, who knows her best, knows the fear that Charity feels all the time. Over and over again of Charity's attempts to direct, to control, to dominate, Sally says she can't help it. She doesn't mean just that it's her nature. She means that Charity is driven by fear to do everything she can to direct events, to stay safe by her definition, to eliminate the element of the unpredictable from her life. She can't tolerate loss of control. When Sid loses his job at Wisconsin, despite all her efforts to control him and the outcome, she crumbles, and it takes her two months in the sanitarium to regain her equilibrium. When she's dying, it's only her carefully laid plans, however absurd, that hold her together. Her friends, who love her, simply accept that Charity is fragile, that her attempts to dominate actually signal her need of support, even at the expense of their own comfort, in Sid's case, even at the expense of his vocation. To them, it's worth the sacrifice to humor her. They know how high the stakes are. So they listen to the music, repack the hamper, take the wrong path for a while. Do these things injure their dignity, trample their rights, diminish them? No, they ennoble them. They do these things for the welfare of someone they love, a unique and valuable person who loves them in return. 
however imperfectly she may sometimes show it, and unselfishly helps them in time of need. Nowadays, the treatment charity doles out might be called emotional abuse, and those on the receiving end of it might be advised to sever ties with her or seek therapy until they no longer feel the need to knuckle under to her demands. Stegner's message is the opposite, not a popular one in our times. It calls for steadfastness, for restraint, for charity. He delivers his message through Sally, the strongest and wisest of the group. We're all flawed. There is always a snake in the garden. We should never abandon each other. We should seek to understand each other, sacrifice for each other, love each other, show charity even, especially when it's hard. Larry and Sally's marriage is the living demonstration of this principle. Charity, the woman, is the ultimate test case, and her friends pass the test.